Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Today, we're here with the brilliant Dr. Joel Furman. Thank you so much for being here with us. My pleasure. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself and the books you've written. Um, we have two here that you want to talk a little bit about, The End of Dieting and Fast Food Genocide. And um, also, please tell us a little bit about how you became a leader in the field of plant-based advocacy. Well, you know, I was on the world figure skating team in my youth. Yes. And then I didn't really think about going to medical school or being a doctor specializing in nutrition. But I was into eating healthy, and my father was into was sickly, and he changed his diet, and we tried to eat real healthy as, a, as children. And I became very passionate about the fact that Americans were destroying their health with a diet style that was creating heart attacks and strokes and dementia. And, no, and the people were going to doctors taking poisonous substances to try to repair themselves. from a, So I got very excited about it. And actually, I started um, dating my wife at the time, and she was, going to she was going to go to medical school, too. Nice. And she said, well, if you're so passionate about this, why don't you go to medical school, too? Quit, you know, well, quit the shoe business, quit your family's business. And because and I was dabbling in some um, courses at night, thinking I might want to go back to medical school. But then once I started getting involved with my wife, I realized, you know, this is, there's no point in me dabbling. I should just do this with both feet in and quit everything, you know, sell my father, sell his shoe stores and retire and me go back to school and I should go back to school full time. So I went back to the postgraduate pre-med program at Columbia because I already had graduated from college without taking the requirements. So I went to medical school with a specific intent of being a physician specializing in nutrition and doing what I'm doing now. Mm. But never did I imagine I'd have so much satisfaction and self-reward from affecting so many hundreds of thousands of people. So, um, you know, here's the thing. When you're helping one person or five people, you feel just as great about doing it. It's and so it's just true. an exciting career. But the fact that I've had, had such a, I've have, you know, written 10 books and have six New York Times bestsellers and had some very popular television shows on PBS has been the icing on the cake, so to speak. And I'm very... Um, just tremendously grateful for the opportunities I've had. I'm grateful for you too. I'm grateful that people you. like you exist. You. Um, should we dive into the questions? You were a former world-class figure skater. What did you eat as a very active athlete? I had a lot of food. You know, I used to drive to, like, we used to go to the rink in the morning before school at like four or five in the morning. Mm -hmm. And the back of my seat of my car was like a bathtub full of food, of fruits and vegetables and nuts and, whole, you know, and manna breads and stuff like that. So you were vegan bunnies. when you were a figure skater? I was, I was, but I ate a lot of food because we were like, I, I, train three hours in the morning. After school, I'd be running home with a pack on my back up the hills, and then we'd go to lift weights, and then we'd go to um, acrobatics class, and then we'd go back to... So it was exercising, it was a professional. It was exercise with my job. And then when I, th through college, I... So I exercised full time, probably six hours or more a day. Wow. So you have to eat a lot of calories, probably more than 4,000 calories a day. And I would be running behind... I remember my mother used to drive the car, and we'd, um, and we'd run behind the car. You know, we'd be... Um, I think, what was she doing there? Playing music or doing something. But we'd be running on hills, running with backs on our pack. How be... fast would she go in the car? Oh, I don't know. Just, we'd be, I don't like know. Five to ten miles an hour. <laughs> 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 You'd have to run after the food. <laughs> you exactly. want to eat ketchup. <laughs> you see so much food when you're an athlete. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> that's true. That's true. What are the gold, silver, and bronze metal foods that make us feel full while being the most nutrient dense? What's the one to one pound rule? Well, look, first of all, we know that certain foods have a tremendous effect on extending human lifespan. And those same foods that prevent cancer have an effect on your appetite to ratchet down the appetite and make you desire to eat the right amount of calories and not overeat. Those same foods that protect against cancer also thicken the microbiome, creating a biofilm over your villi in the small intestines, which slows the glycemic effect of the foods you eat, lowering your risk of diabetes, extending your lifespan. So what I'm saying is that when you eat foods like vegetables and beans and mushrooms and onions, and actually there are four foods that have the most power, are too raw and too cooked. The too raw, of course, are green cruciferous vegetables and the onion and scallion family. When you, they promote the both of healthy bacteria. They produce very beneficial anti-diabetic and anti-inflammatory compounds. And then you have the two cooked foods, beans and mushrooms. Very, you should say, the right type of fuel that favors the growth of healthy bacteria in your gut. So, so, what, so of course, we're having people to want people to eat a pound of raw vegetables a day and a pound of cooked vegetables a day. You know, I always say that we've landed the man on the moon already, yes. which, which means we already know how to win the war on cancer. It's been done. We know how to win the war on cancer. How do we do that? Vegetables are the answer. But people don't like the answer. 
They're looking for a magic pill they can take and still three, smoke three packs a day and not get lung cancer with a magic pill. They want to be able to eat their hot dogs and bacon and, and pizza and croissants and yeah. candy and still not get breast cancer and be able to take a magic pill. Never going to happen. It's not a fairy tale. This is real life. In real life, if you're not willing to eat a lot of vegetables, you're going to be in big trouble. And it's also what we don't eat as well as what we do eat, correct? Absolutely. You know, it's that, that these frankenfoods that have permeated the American diet, right now it's 60% of calories come from processed foods that have all the um, incredible, dangerous effects. And I know a lot of people out there are now recognizing, finally realizing that what you eat creates heart attacks, obesity and diabetes, yes, dementia, yes, they're agreeing with that, cancer, of course, what you eat is the major factor, yes, but, but who's talking about the fact that these foods create mental illness yeah. and dementia and depression, anxiety? You know, 100 years ago, one in, a th one in a hundred Americans were mentally ill, and today it's one in five. And the link between processed foods and commercial baked goods and, j and fast food and major depression is that even two servings a week increases your risk by about 51%. And that people, and they, they get these highly calorically concentrated foods that flood the bloodstream very rapidly. It stimulates dopamine receptors in the brain, making you become dopamine sensitive over time weakening your willpower, making you live to eat, and the rest of your life doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. Your creativity, your intelligence goes down. You, you become a drug-seeking animal. Do you think there's a connection between drug use and poor diet? Uh, you know, not only is there a connection between drug use and poor diet, but the connection is, is established in the science of literature. Right now, we see in medical studies, which I talk about in my book, Fast Food Genocide, that the that the link between candy and sugar consumption in childhood and later life illegal drug behaviors and, and, and criminal behavior and drug use is more solid than the link between living in an orphanage, social isolation, poverty, bad parents, abusive parents. The strongest link is what you eat in your childhood. Those, so what you eat in your childhood has been shown to lower intelligence, reduce your opportunity for economic success, reduce your chance of happiness, predispose you to drug abuse, and give you, a, and of course, give you higher rates of diabetes and heart attacks and autoimmune conditions and other medical problems which are destroying people's lives. Yeah. And right now, um, it's really the most tragic, um, the most tragic um, thing that befalls Americans is so many people having diabetes and strokes at young ages, losing their intelligence, becoming either food addicts or drug addicts. The, if you live in a food desert in an inner city and you're an overweight diabetic, now scientists are estimating you lost potentially 45 years of life lost because these people are dying between 40 and 50 years old instead of between when they should die, between 90 and 100 years old. You know what I mean? We, humans are supposed to be living to around 100 years old if they take good care of their health. And a nutritarian diet, which I'm recommending, which has the full portfolio of the beneficial foods human needs for protection against cancer and for brain protection, enables you to live that long without being sickly and That's still fully enjoy your life. Let's talk about what foods make up that portfolio. Because, you know, right now, science, the nutritional science has made incredible advances. We see, for example, we could throw a dart at any one of those foods, like mushrooms, for example. We'll talk mm -hmm. about one of those foods. Mm -hmm. Studies on mushrooms, there was one study on Asian women that showed that people who ate 10 grams a day on the average, which is about the size of your thumb, had a 69% lower risk of breast cancer. Just a little bit of mushroom a day. Just a little bit of mushroom a day and having it on a regular basis. Um, and Almost any food we look at that's in that G-bomb list, look at um, the lignans in flax seeds and chia seeds and sesame seeds, these, these lignin-containing nuts and seeds. Um, one study was done, on, for it's a 10-year study on women who had breast cancer already, and they followed their risk of dying from breast cancer over that 10-year period, and those that had a third of a milligram of lignin a day in their diet had a 71% decrease mortality over that 10-year period. And that's women who already had cancer. And they were already only in a third of a milligram of the lignin. In other words, a teaspoon of fl ground flax seeds has seven milligrams of lignin, not a third of one milligram. And you're not supposed to wait till you have cancer to start taking it. If you do, the point is, is that Americans are destroying themselves with cancer-causing foods. But when they find out that they don't have to get demented in cancer and they can really protect themselves, then we recommend nutritional excellence. Not moderate change in their diet, because we want their body to be flooded with these high, these very protective foods we're talking about. Because then we're seeing that the body can repair the broken DNA crosslinks. It can, it can fix the methylation defects. It can remove the buildup of advanced glycation end products. In other words, there are mechanisms in the cell 
which enable the cell to repair the damage that occurred earlier in life, but only if you establish those high phytonutrients that come from eating green vegetables and berries and seeds and mushrooms. So that's why we have the design of these, this full portfolio. You know. So what does G-bomb stand for? That's right, G-bomb stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. And by greens, we're talking here about the most powerful protective greens are the green leafy cruciferous family, like arugula and collard greens and kale. And so they're, because those, that family of vegetables have a very potent anti-cancer and um, ingredients that slow the aging process and protect the brain and protect the blood vessels and have anti-inflammatory effects. And those are called isothiocyanides. And we, in the medical literature, they call them ITCs. Mm -hmm. And the ITCs from these green vegetables form in the mouth as you're chewing the vegetable. So they're not in the vegetable until you, until you actually break down the cell wall and liberate that enzyme that makes the ITCs. The enzyme's called myrosinase. But the myrosinase enzyme is heat sensitive. So if you cook your broccoli too much, you cook your kale till it's like mush, or you put it in a soup, then when you chew the vegetable that's mushy and heated, you're not going to form that many anti-cancer compounds. So we should be consuming them raw. Or just walked for five minutes or so, What's not walk? overly cooked. Like you like water stuff. walk them, you okay. water walk them in a walk for five or six minutes. Okay. But we also, in nutritarian style of cooking, we can take raw kale or mustard greens or, or collard greens or even the onion because the alienase enzyme in onion is heat sensitive too and you want to form those anti-cancer nutrients in the onion family. But we'll, we'll put a ladle, just a drop of soup liquid in the blender and we'll blend the the collards of the kale raw, or blend the onion or the scallion or the leek raw, so we'll, that'll take the place of chewing, it'll break open the cells, forming the anti-cancer compounds that will be formed while it's still not cooked, and then you can add it to the soup to be cooked, to cook in the soup, or to cook in your stew, or your, or your chili, because once you form those compounds, they're not gonna be destroyed by the heat, but it would have inhibited their formation if we deactivated the enzymes before they were formed when the cell wall was broken. So the, methodology, the method in which we cook food is also enhancing the phytonutrient absorption. What are your thoughts on the raw food diet? Does cooking result in vitamin loss and enzymes being destroyed? Yes, exactly. We're talking, we were just talking about yeah. that, how enzymes are destroyed. But um, even though I think your diet should contain a lot of raw foods, and I, I have one of my mantras is to say to people, eat a salad every day as a main dish, at least once a day. And you put in your raw onion and, your, and use a nut and seed based dressing, your green vegetables, arugula, or a little shredded bok choy or kale in there. You have your lettuces. There's more than 200 studies showing a very close association between higher consumption of raw vegetables and protection of almost every type of cancer. It's an essential part of an anti-cancer lifestyle. And the fact that we make a salad dressing with some nuts and seeds in the dressing, like you know, tomato sauce, tomato paste, roasted garlic, some almonds, and maybe sunflower seeds, and some fig vinegar, or balsamic vinegar, and a few raisins, or a, you know, we'll make all these incredible dressings, but we're using nuts and seeds, and using a, like a half an ounce of nuts and seeds as a salad dressing it facilitates the absorption of the anti-cancer nutrients that are absorbed in the bloodstream. The studies on eating green vegetables and eating all these vegetables without any fat in the meal or, little, or no added fat means that, that the, you absorb about one-tenth the amount of nutrients. You absorb 10 times more or even 20 times more nutrients. And we see that in, this, in the major epidemiologic studies, we have large numbers of people followed for decades on end and seeing how long they live or what they die of we see that utilizing some nuts and seeds extends human lifespan tremendously and prevents cancer deaths and cardiovascular deaths. What are EFAs and what is the right amount and type for optimal health? Do growing children and athletes need more? So we pay attention to the amount of high caloric foods. We don't want people snacking on nuts and eating large amounts. But if we're eating, the, we're eating a small amount mm -hmm. to facilitate the absorption of the chemicals, you have more anti-inflammatory effects and they're very satiating and people are not overeating. They're losing weight at least two pounds a week. If you have a person who's overeating on nuts or something and it's mm -hmm. inhibiting their weight loss, then it's not favorable. Yeah. But as long as people are able to control their amount they're eating and keep them successfully losing weight as they're getting better, it's much safer to include a small amount of nuts in the diet. And then with the meta-analysis, not just the Seventh-day Adventist study, the Seventh-day Adventist 2 study that came out in 2018 mm -hmm. showed that those vegans and those Seventh-day Adventists, the near vegans and the vegans, in the lowest quintile of nut and seed consumption, compared to the highest quintile, quintile means five different categories, mm -hmm. had a 39% increased risk of cardiovascular death without eating nuts and seeds compared to those utilizing nuts and seeds. In the meta-analysis, when we analyzed studies that involved you know, 80,000 people followed for many years and um, looking at um, causes of death, we found that the addition of nuts or seeds on a regular basis 
had a tremendous effect at extending all-cause mortality, reducing both cancer death and cardiovascular death. It makes you naturally want to eat less calories. Mm. Caloric adequacy, or I should say, micronutrient adequacy supp suppresses the appetite. And paying attention to the nutritional quality of what you're eating makes you much more satisfied and helps the brain get over food addiction. When you flood the brain with nutrients, it's the, how should we say, the therapy to enable people to control their unrelenting and uncontrollable appetites. Yeah. And fiber, too. Absolutely. Fiber and nutrients shut down the apostat, and the concentrated calories ratchet up the apostats. And the foods that ratchet up the apostat, the biggest scam that's been perpetrated on the American population is, is tricking them into thinking that oil is a health food. They're pouring oil over their food, which is excess calories. And people, because when you eat an oil, it doesn't ratchet down your appetite. If you went to a buffet and you had a tablespoon of olive oil before you got to eat on the buffet, you wouldn't eat 120 less calories because you had a tablespoon of olive oil. You eat the same amount. If they mix the oil in with the food, you eat more calories because it makes you want to overeat calories. And those calories have no fiber and no significant nutrient load, and they ratchet up fat storage hormone, and they rush into the bloodstream very rapidly, and they make you want to eat more food. But if you had walnuts versus a walnut oil or sesame seeds versus a sesame oil, those calories don't come in in five minutes, like 30 calories a minute. They come in one or two calories a minute. And your body preferentially burns that for energy and doesn't store it as fat. And all those calories are not biologically accessible to the body because a percentage of those calories are passed through into the toilet bowl. Because the sterols and stanols, the fibers and nuts and seeds, pull the fat into the toilet bowl and they suck some cholesterol out of the villi, out of the, out of the blood vessels, as they're pulling fat into the toilet. So there's, there's biological effects that make, the, the, when you have fat consumed in a whole food like nuts and seeds, a completely different biological effect than when you take the fat out of the food and pull the fibers and the sterols outside of it. It's the same thing we see when you eat sugar out of the, you know, when you eat the sugar in, in an apple or in a mango or a berry, it's a completely different biological effect than if you took the sugar out of the food and ate it without the fiber. You know, it's a, so it's really, so whole foods are the kicker here. But the right portfolio to include a good variety of mm -hmm. these anti-cancer foods means they work synergistically. We really can get some medicinal power here to have people not get cancer. What are your thoughts on digestive enzymes? Can we heal our guts through plant foods so we aren't dependent on another pill? Well, when you're eating an animal product diet, see, we're primates. We're like gorillas and chimps, and we're meant to be eating a diet very high in vegetables. And our diet is ideally designed to produce those enzymes we need to digest a vegetable-based diet. When we eat a meat-based diet, we're a little under the eight ball here because we're not producing as much acid as a cat or, you know, or as a dog even. Mm -hmm. we, don't ha we have a long digestive tract. We don't produce all those protein digestive enzymes as efficiently. So maybe the digestive enzyme might be helpful for somebody who's on a high protein diet or you know, one of these paleo diets because they're really suffering with all the acids and stuff. And unfortunately, they're gonna cut short their life that way. But, but here's the thing, you're, you're not taxing your enzyme capacity when you eat a healthy diet. Your body easily digests this food. And the more you get used to eating it, I mean, I know when people start eating beans, they haven't developed the bacteria that are produced in the gut to digest them well. So they may produce gas or have a little problem digesting beans in the beginning. So we start with a smaller amount of beans until they get used to digesting them. But over time, mm -hmm. they produce the bacteria, they produce the timing and sequence of release of enzymes, and they know, and their body learns how to digest them better. We, we are an animal who that can really digest these, this plant material very, very well. And the whole key is not to have to be high on medicinal substances. Live a healthy life so you can avoid doctors, you know, and avoid the alternative and natural doctors as well. We don't need to have treatments. We need to be able to avoid health professionals and live in a manner so we can stay healthy. Are slower or faster metabolisms better for longevity? Well, you know, we're talking about moderate caloric restriction here. Now, Let's look at, I'm weighing about 150 pounds. Mm -hmm. If I eat over, if we determine on a calorimeter and how much calories I need each day, and I overshoot that by 100 pound, calories a day, I'll gain weight and I'll shorten my lifespan. But if I undershoot it by 50 to 100 calories a day, I won't keep losing weight. My body will try to slow down its metabolic rate by lowering its respiratory quotient, the amount of calories lost through breathing. It can control, it, my body temperature will lower, get a little cold, I'll, I won't tolerate the the cold weather as much. I'll get it, my body temperature will lower a little bit, but I'll tolerate the heat much better. The point is, your thyroid will be adjusted. The body will put into play various mechanisms to slow its metabolic rate down so you cannot, so it can maintain the amount of muscles for my daily activity. The body doesn't want to keep losing. 
And those biological mechanisms will slow the aging process. And that really is the only fountain of youth. The only thing that really effectively slows aging is moderately slowing your metabolic rate. So while everybody in society is looking for a magic pill to speed up the metabolic rate so they can eat more food and not get fat, mm -hmm. we know that what we really want to do is we want to undershoot our calories by a hair, maybe eat an earlier dinner and don't overeat at night and go back and hunks, be a little touch hungry some evenings and, and don't eat until you're hungry and know how much you're eating for lunch so you're hungry before you eat dinner. If you're not hungry at dinner time, you overeat at lunch. People are saying, oh, I'm never hungry. If you're never hungry, you're chronically overeating because hunger is a good measuring tool to know we're not overeating because our hunger keeps recurring. So it's that moderately undershooting that, that may slow down a metabolic rate just a touch that's the formula for staying youthful and, and being strong and protecting your bones and, and, being, and being vibrant and healthy when you're 85 and 95 years old. Does what we eat as a child affect our risk for breast and prostate cancers in adulthood? And if so, why? You know, what you ate before you had that child affected the child's risk of cancer even. In and other words... grandmother too, right? Right, that's right. So, for example, you're a young woman and the eggs... You may have children in the future. The eggs for your future children are living in you. And if you eat poorly, you're going to destroy... You're going to hurt, potentially hurt those eggs and hurt your children's health. So you're eating for your future family right I'm now. I'm vegan babies. What's that? <laughs> I'm going to have vegan babies, if and when. So, so anyway, so you were saying so, yes, eggs. So, so right. So... And then when the eggs start to replicate and they form in your body when you're pregnant, the cells are replicating rapidly. And then when the child are growing, the cells are replicating more rapidly. And when cells are replicating or growing, their DNA becomes unraveled and more exposed to damage. Once we're adults and we're no longer growing, it's harder to damage the cells because it's like winding up the, the, the rubber band in a tight around the golf ball. You can't get to the middle of it that well. Mm. So yes, we're finding out that dietary exposure to carcinogens and to junk food and fast food and to, you know, and to bacon and, you know, you know what I'm talking, grilled burgers and nitrates. And it affects you when you're pregnant and increases your risk or even before pregnancy. It increases your risk of having a baby with acute blastocytic leukemia or childhood cancer or brain tumors. You know, and, and, but when you're a child eating these foods, it's increasing your risk of autoimmune disease and later life cancer. So what I'm saying right now is, is, is two things. Um, one is that what we eat in the first five years of life affects our entire life for the rest of our life. Just five years. Well, their whole, what we eat our whole life affects yeah, 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 yeah. it. But the first five years is so powerfully important. It, it sets up so many, because just think about the age at which a woman goes through puberty affects her future risk of breast That's cancer. True. And what you ate in the first five years of life affected your age of puberty. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's all this, and the diet, That's the true. same thing that drives acne, drives puberty, early puberty, and drives breast cancer. And that's it. Higher insulin and higher IGF-1. That marriage, a diet with a lot of sugar and high glycemic carbohydrates, you know, veg, um, fruit juices and apple juice and soda and, and honey and maple syrup and a lot of animal products, especially dairy products, which drive up IGF-1. That IGF-1, you know, think about this. The American diet has a carbohydrate, a high glycemic carbohydrate mixed with a piece of meat, a hamburger, or a, or a pizza with cheese on it, or a cheese, uh, cream and cheese sandwich, or a, su a Subway, or a Mac, or, or a pasta, or spaghetti and meatballs, or everything's meat with a carbohydrate. And that's why people say, well, what about moderation? Or what about a Mediterranean diet? Or why do you have to be so perfect? But, but you know what? Because you, that's why, because you cause damage that if left unfixed, could still result in some problems later on in your life. And, some, and we want to have the body's ability to repair itself. So what I'm saying here that flooding the body with nutrients suppresses the appetite, and makes you more comfortable with the right amount of calories. You can't be comfortable with eating the right amount of calories if your diet is nutritionally poor. You'll be a, a food craving machine and you're not gonna repair the damages that were done to the, for what you ate for the first 40 years if you're not gonna get the, rid of your, you're not gonna really protect yourself from colon and breast cancer with these moderate changes. You have to make a radical change to really almost make your diet perfect. And also, for so many people that have become food addicts, the keeping one foot in both worlds, where they're trying to eat some healthy food, but still gonna have the hot dog or the croissant or the ice cream on the weekend, it drives people into addictive binging and makes them yo-yo the weight and it interferes with their ability to eat healthy because they can eat healthy for a while and then they start getting into these foods as they are treat or the cheat foods and it drives them to going crazy again and going off their making, you know, big travel off their dietary path. It's really better to stay on the path, especially when you're a food addict. You don't get a cocaine 
addict better from cocaine by giving them cocaine on the weekends. Because then they're going to go back into binging on cocaine again. A person has to abstain for a long enough period of time so they lose the physical addiction and the emotional addiction and to give their taste buds a chance to retrain themselves to enjoy these delicious natural flavors. And one thing I think I specialize in and could brag about is the recipes we've created that taste so incredibly fantastic. Mm. And I, you know, I can say to a patient, I can say, you know, look, you've made the choices about what you've been eating over those last couple of years, and you've gotten the problems with diabetes or whatever the problems you've developed right now. Now I'm going to choose what you eat, not you. Don't that. eat what you like to eat, and don't eat what you feel like eating. And don't eat, you're you're going to eat only what I want you to eat, and I don't care if you like it or not. Just <laughs> eat it, yeah. because I'm going to promise you within three months that I'm going to teach you, I'm going to make you like it, I love it. Your taste buds are going to change. I'll, I will promise you and bet you anything that you're going to love eating this way if you give it time. Don't judge it right now. Don't judge it whether you like it or not. Just do it mm -hmm. and watch the weight pour off you and watch your heart disease go away. Watch your diabetic numbers go, get you off the blood pressure medications, get you off the statin drugs which cause weight gain, fatigue, and diabetes, get you off the blood pressure medications that increase risk of cancer and lower the diastolic blood pressure to cause cardiac arrhythmias. These drugs are dangerous. Get the person off the drugs, get them healthy, and then if they stick with this and see the results, their taste buds will strengthen. They'll get off the medications first, and then their taste buds will strengthen, and they'll learn all these great recipes, and they'll start to love it. And all these people you're meeting that were here at my yeah. facility, yeah. they love the food now Did that they've been here a few months. I have some that couldn't stand it. And I said, <laughs> they said, they thought it would taste too bland. And I said, you have this conversation with me six to eight weeks from now, and you just tell me, we're going to learn the recipes, and I want you to come up with it. Four, just four salad dressings that you love. We're going to teach you like 15 salad dressings. You pick out the four you like the best. I'm going to have you learn how to make those really good. I want you to pick out four veg ways you can prepare you know, a mixed vegetable dish and have with a, with a sauce, like a Thai you know, lemongrass, mm -hmm. you know, hemp seed sauce. With, you know, or, or let me let have four ways of flavoring vegetables you like. Let me have at least three or four soups you love. And let me, we'll give you about like eight more to try out and you'll see which ones you like the best. But mm -hmm. let's talk about this. And we give great desserts too. Yeah. You know, and even over, over the holidays coming up, we're making incredible desserts that they're not that sweet, but their taste buds have gotten so strong now that even the subtle sweetness of fruit tastes great to them. And like, for example, we're making um, an apple pie a la mode mm -hmm. over for the Christmas break here. Mm -hmm. um, so we're making our, our ice cream. We're all going to make it together. We were taking freshly cracked macadamia nuts, mm -hmm. cracking them with a hammer, it's on the so sidewalk together. It'll be fun. They'll know how to crack them. And then we put these, because they're so much sweeter when they're freshly cracked and more and also flavorful. Um, you know, and then we put that in the blender with some frozen banana and real vanilla bean powder to make the most incredible vanilla ice cream with just three ingredients. Don't forget, there's no dates in there. There's no date sugar. There's no honey. There's no maple syrup. No, no sweetener. It's just, the, it's just the banana and the macadamia nuts and the vanilla bean powder. That's it. But it's sweet enough. Yeah. And the flavor is incredible. And you put a dollop of that on top of a, maybe some apples that have been stewed in like, you know, with nutmeg and cinnamon, little flax seeds, little walnuts, maybe a crust made of coconut, untreated coconut flakes with a little bit of, um, you know. That's amazing. Oh, it, well, it's going to be incredible. I'm coming. You definitely should. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have such incredible food here. So people are smiling as they're losing weights, and they're not overdoing the desserts, but of course, um, there, we say that most of the people coming here lose 15 pounds the first month, and most people follow my plan lose 15 pounds. I had two men that came in two and a half months ago, two men that both had resting chest pain, both on nitrates, because they were having just crushing pain. They couldn't even walk without getting heart chest pain. And at rest, they were having pain, had to pop nitros. They were candidates for being in the hospital. And they were told they needed urgent, you know, they needed angioplasty or bypass surgery. Both those people, Within about eight weeks, lost 45 pounds. They lost about, they were losing weight like crazy because there's so much water retention. They were from eating the bad diet. And so much, just, the tissues are, well, not just losing fat. You can't lose fat that fast, but they're jumping water weight, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're walking up the hills without chest pain. You know, they're off their blood pressures back to normal again. You know, it's amazing how fast they got well. You know, you, the time you can have go to the hospital, get evaluated, and be, have the stress test, the cardiac catheterization, your bypass surgery, your angioplasty, go back to cardiac rehab, and go back to work two months later, these people are all better with none of that intervention, just by coming here to eat the healthy food. Cracking open the macadamia nuts. <laughs> 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 and getting those greens in. <laughs> Please help explain the two different types of strokes, and what can we be eating to prevent them? That's right. The two types of strokes are a hemorrhagic stroke and an ischemic or embolic stroke. Heart attacks are caused by a clot. And a clot traveling to the brain or forming in the brain is the same cause as a heart attack. That's called an ischemic or embolic stroke. 
It's symbolic if, it's, if a clot travels up to the brain. Those strokes can be very, very devastating, but not as devastating or life-threatening as a hemorrhagic stroke, which usually can kill a person or put them in a nursing home crippled for the rest of their life. In any case, the most common kind of strokes, 90% of strokes are the, the same type as heart attacks are caused by a clot. And the American diet, a lot of animal products and processed food, raises your cholesterol and predisposes you to both heart attacks and ischemic strokes. However, in Asia, where they have a diet with more vegetables and fish and salt, they don't have as many ischemic or embolic strokes. They have more hemorrhagic strokes. And we find that higher cholesterol levels might be protective against hemorrhagic stroke because having more atherosclerosis and more thickened blood vessels, which increases your risk of clots, may offer some degree of protection against the high blood pressure from the, uh, from the high blood pressure on a high salt diet. So what I'm saying now is it appears that a high salt diet is more dangerous for a person with lower cholesterol on a more cardiac favorable diet. So a vegan or new vegan would be a high risk of hemorrhagic stroke if they salt their food. The animal product eater might be a lower risk of hemorrhagic stroke because they already have thickened blood vessels in the brain that are more resistant to hemorrhaging. But they're more prone to having a clot or an ischemic stroke now. So in this country, we have a lot of ischemic strokes and not as many hemorrhagic strokes. And in Japan and South Korea and China, they have more hemorrhagic strokes, not as many ischemic strokes. Finally, so we really you, don't want you people. You really are brilliant. <laughs> you really are. I mean, this is a lot of information. I mean, for, I mean, you say it so easily, but keep going. I'm sorry. Thank you. Well, I just, <laughs> I think it's that I just, I'm dedicated to, yeah. to, to studying nutrition because I love it and I read everything. And, and I read, like, I might be read, you know, thousands of nutritional articles every year. And I keep up to date on the most recent research and the full breadth of all the research that's done. And you know what? What people say, you know, oh, well, there's all these different contradictory studies. It's not what we really see. Is that when we look at studies that, are, that go on for decades with large numbers of people and have hard endpoints like death or cancer or heart attacks. In other words, what, why do we give a study more credence? If it went on for a year or two or if it went on for 20 years? If it had 50 people in it or if it had 50,000 people in it? If it looked at whether the person lost weight or controlled their diabetes better or if a person actually died of heart attacks. So what I'm saying right now is we have a large numbers of study with a high credence value. And we really know that these ketogenic diets, these paleo diets that are high in meat, we know how dangerous they are long term. We know about the value of these beneficial foods of eating a diet high in vegetables. We know that adding some nuts and seeds to the diet benefits you long term. We can look at the studies that we can rate studies based on the quality of what they're looking at. And the high quality studies always show the same thing. They're not controversial. It shows that you can't be healthy unless you eat a lot of vegetables. No such thing. If you're not gonna eat a lot of vegetables and live close to a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> what are HCAs? Where do they come from and what do they do to us? Well, there's a lot of, when you cook meat at high temperature, you form different compounds that are carcinogenic. You form nitrosamino compounds, you form heterocyclic amines, you form acrylamides in high amounts, and, and advanced location end products are formed. There's a lot of carcinogenic changes when, when animal products are cooked at high temperature. And you form some carcinogenic changes when plant foods are cooked at high temperature and darkened or browned or, or toasted to high temperature as well, but more when animal products are cooked, by the way. And then, so it's like it's bad enough that the people are eating too much animal products. But they're also grill, going to a restaurant where they're grilling them, flame broiling them, barbecuing them, cooking them. So they require a lot of heat, and that really damages the food and makes and puts you at high risk of cancer. Um, of course, the animal product that's organic, natural, caught a wild antelope out of the woods, though that high degree of animal protein in a diet still creates unfavorable bacteria that increases the inflammatory compounds like t trimethylamine oxide, TMAO, and other um, compounds. So where people say, oh, that's diet, that diet is so bad, or that, that study showed animal products were bad because they're eating commercially raised animal products. That's not true. That most of these studies are done in other countries where they, where they have um, wild and, and gray animal products that are grazed and not commercially lot fed like we do in this country, mm -hmm. like Australia, like you know, you know, Brazil, and. Argentina, where they have a lot of um, animal products there. And we see the same thing, whether the animal product is wild, whether you're eating salamanders, you know, frogs, snakes, or wildy beast. The point I'm making, even if, and those are higher in omega-3, of course, but we're eating, the, we're eating a, a more poor quality animal product, but even if you ate a higher quality animal product, animal products still do not contain phytochemicals and antioxidants. They still don't create a favorable microbiome. 
they still have too much protein, and the, and the high biological protein drives up IGF-1, which ages us, and is linked to prostate and breast cancer. So even the most favorable type of animal product, even without the heterocyclic amines, is still going to increase a person's risk of cancer. What are your thoughts on cold therapy, like ice baths and cryotherapy for inflammation and muscle repair? There might be some long-term beneficial effects, but they're minor compared to, and they're not that critical or important. The real, you have to go focus on the most important things here, and that's the quality of what you eat, and then making sure your muscles have, are, are, um, have enough blood circulation, you're getting circulation around to your tissues. And we see people um, coming in here with all types of pain syndromes, getting such great recovery because we're combining the diet with, mu with musculoskeletal work. Nice. Thanks so much for tuning in. Love Gianna and... Dr. Furman too. <laughs>